Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John. This is Media True Nerd, and welcome back to Fallout New Vegas Autumn Leaves. You join me here back in the Hypatia Library Vault, where it appears we are finally ready to try and solve the murder of the former caretaker, Professor Cartwright, who, uh, well, he wasn't a very nice man. He created all these sentient robots, and then he did not really treat them as something that a sentient deserves to be treated. And somebody murdered him. We just don't know quite who. But now we've thoroughly investigated everyone else that actually ever lived in this vault, as far as I can tell. It's time to try and solve that. And I'm going to start with Roland, because there were a few things at the crime scene. A crushed medic syringe, and a deputy star badge. And the star badge belonged to Roland. Roland, I found your star by the body. Did you kill him? What? Are you fucking kidding me? I don't like that accusatory tone in your voice, motherfucker. How the hell would I have killed him when every single bite in my program prevents it? Well, in which case, why is the deputy badge by the corpse? Let me see that. Uh, yeah. What if it is? Don't you ever get tired of picking up shit lying on the ground? No, no, no. Unfortunately, I spoke to Helena about this. I suffer from a very bad case of protagonism. And would you believe uh, I actually found it near the body of your master and heard some good stories from- No, I won't tell him about Helena. I won't say that, but I did find it near the master's body. Yeah, and there's plenty of reasons why it would be there. And this badge that I know for a fact you try and knock off by bumping into bookshelves uh, because you made it fall over. Why, you goddamn fucking prick. You made Helena spill the beans. So yes, indeed, we have a working theory. He bumped into the bookcase, killed his master, but on purpose, by accident, or maybe not at all. Oh, here comes the punchline. This is going to be good. And the sad thing is, you bumped into it too hard, the shelf fell on him and killed him. So, my starting accusation is this was an accident, just manslaughter. That has got to be the most stupid story I have ever heard. That is some kind of Three Stooges type shit you got there. What the fuck ever? Come on, Roland. Did you do this on purpose or by accident? There's that accusatory tone again. Yeah, it's a nice story and all, but I didn't kill him. Not on purpose, nor accidentally. And, okay, what can we actually do here? If you're not defending yourself, that's confession. You could help me with an alibi or some reason the badge is there. If silence is your answer, I'll have no trouble convincing James you did it. Oh, dear. Come on, alibi or some form of reason, Roland. Let's do this properly. I could, but I won't. Sorry for the blue balls. Okay, this is not very good for you, Roland. It just makes it look like you did it. And you're going to dispense your justice how, huh? Aim a gun at my head and summarily execute me? Please. Whether I'm guilty or not, the second you get aggressive, that security system is going to activate and fry your ass like Sunday morning breakfast. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Not if potentially, you know, everyone else agrees that you were the one that did it. What a fucking tattletale. Fine, I'll tell you. The reason my badge was there was... Shit. Listen, I know you're going to think it's kind of gay, but we'd kind of play tag sometimes. It was just a game, okay? Okay? Is that all right with you? I'm a clumsy fucking idiot, and sometimes I'd slam into the bookcase and my badge would fall off. The last time I went looking for him, I found him there lying face first down in that pile of books. I left my badge there because, well, I just... I was just feeling a little sentimental, okay? Okay, asshole? Fuck you. This is a pretty damn flimsy story. An incredibly flimsy story that doesn't make a huge amount of sense because Protectrons are slow and unwieldy, they'd be appalling tag partners. But let's take him at his word for the time being. If you claim that you were actually not involved in this in the slightest, in that case, you were at the crime scene first before anyone else saw it. So, well, one, why didn't you bloody tell anyone else? But two, did you actually see anything that leads me in a new direction? No. As soon as he went cold, I went out looking for a book on, uh, taxidermy. I didn't spend much time with him. Alright. Intriguing. And... Ooh, I can put the badge back on him. Yeah, I'm doing that. Get that thing off me now. And there we... Wait, where is it? 
It says it's been removed, but I don't see him on him. Maybe they could actually figure out how to make it stick on him. So, let's use some pray tell to see if we can actually get some straight answers out of him. So, pray tell, did you kill him? No! Happy now? Okay, I'm gonna be honest, that is actually a bit more convincing there, because, well, unless he's just made up the pray tell thing. Hmm, interesting. So, pray tell, are you still gonna stick with your stupid tag story? Listen. I know you're gonna think it's kind No, he is no. gonna stick with the tag story, and presumably therefore it's true because of the pray tell business, assuming that wasn't a lie itself. So in which case, who do you think killed him? No, I don't. But I had plans, you know. Plans to push our master to the brink of madness. That someone beat me to the punch with something as ironic as a crumpling bookshelf is just unbelievable. Even if it means working with you, so help me God, I'll help you find the fucker who did this. Right, the pray tell business means I can be pretty confident that it's not going to be him. So in which case, yeah, who's it going to be? Arthur can't knock over a bookshelf, or probably, unless the security he's building up can do more than we think it can. That's getting it down to limited options already. Yeah, somehow well. Okay, maintenance bot we can rule out on grounds that it never had a personality module at the time of the murder. That just leaves Edgar, James and Helena. I guess Edgar is more likely, given it just seems he's a bit unpredictable and sometimes malfunctions, but... Interesting. Who's it gonna be? And by the way, Roland, I am sorry if you genuinely are a bit sad about this. I find it even more sad the mere fact that you, of all people, are pitying me. Well, fair enough. Let's move on in that case, because who's my next suspect? Well, I guess I just said, it has to be James, Helena, or Edgar. Fine, well in that case, let's go and visit the people who at least conceivably could have done it, i.e. people who are mobile and were sentient at the time of the murder. So, having started with Roland, let's see if Helena's got anything new to add about that crushed medex syringe. I heard. So you think our master's death isn't accidental? That's certainly startling. I hope you will be able to shed some light on this. And yes indeed, we do have something here, new bit of dialogue. Any wild guess based on the Medex thing? No, the only one with a solid motive also has the best possible alibi. The maintenance bot. And yes indeed, we heard about this previously, the maintenance bot who had his personality stripped away from him, but... It was still stripped away at the time of the murder, so I'm guessing that's what you're going to say. But let's just see if she's got anything to add on. The maintenance bot always has an abhorrent attitude towards our master. If there was any way for him to kill him, he would have found it. Yeah, but I feel like you would have been justified, Helena. I don't really like you taking Cartwright's side in this. At the time our master died, the maintenance bot had lost his personality module. And with it all possible motivation to carry any kind of malevolent intention. Yes, lost. Helena, you're taking Cartwright's side a bit here. Or maybe you just don't know what actually happened. Intriguing. Well, nothing from James or Arthur. So back in the basement to speak to the two wild cards. Because, yeah, potentially Edgar is unpredictable and maintenance bot has got the motive. But yeah, surely anyone would know if Edgar had left his basement and is even together enough to have plotted. And also, why would he have done that? Let's chat to see if he has anything to say at least. And no, can't even ask him Let's anything. Go. Fine. Maintenance bot then. You've got to have something new to say, otherwise I'm all out of leads unless I've missed something. So yes indeed, I'm trying to figure out who killed him, but are you even going to be willing to help given the hatred you seem to nurse for him? I will help you, but nevertheless, I must ask you this first. Why do you think I should? Intriguing. Honestly, you've got no reason to, and I could understand why you'd actually refuse. But uh, maybe you'd like to anyway, just because I'm curious and you want to help me because I helped you? And yes, indeed, you seem with it and intelligent, and you've been out cold for a century, so your perspective on this might be interesting next to the others. <laughs> That's quite the euphemism. So go on then, what have you got to say? Where do you want to start? Who do you think did it? Was it an accident? Was it a murder? Honestly, I'm divided on that point. It could well have been an accident. Possibly Roland and an accident might well be the right way to look at it. 
and can't you tell me outright who your prime suspect is? Yeah, have you got anything to say about this? I can't. Even if I have some observations, making wild guesses and ill-informed decisions would harm the library. I don't want to bias your judgement, and besides, I have no conclusive proof. Fine, so he's got a theory, but he's not willing to share it. Hmm. If it was an accident, it was certainly a very strange accident, and no one's actually owning up to it, so uh, let's say it was murder for now. Why? And yes, indeed, while this could technically still be an accident, let's start with the basic facts here. He couldn't make the bookshelf fall by himself, so someone else has to have pushed it. Correct. What's next? Who killed him? One of our guests? Or not? True enough. Potentially, based on what I'm seeing so far, the robots don't seem to be doing a spectacularly good job of there being an obvious candidate here. Everyone's got a reason they can't have done it. Arthur doesn't have arms or legs. This guy was out cold. Edgar doesn't seem with it enough to have done it. Roland was a possibility, but I've got the override. That means I know he's telling the truth and he says he didn't do it. Blender and James don't really have much rationale to have done so. So that Piper, who was first mentioned to me, she's still a bit of a mystery. And we know they did argue, so... Uh, I guess she's probably just my prime suspect, logically. And what makes you say that? And your protocols preventing you from harming humans. Yeah, but we know those can actually be overridden. You definitely didn't all love him. And why wouldn't I say that? I'd have probably killed him myself. Uh, yeah, let's just start with the protocols, though you'll probably call me out on that. They do, but they have been exceptions. You probably have heard the story about the slavers. We already killed humans before. Alright, so let's switch tacks and say that one of you guys did it to see what your take on that is. Why? Anybody could have pushed the shelf on him. Okay, now you're just being flipping contrary. Ah, but an intelligence check here. Yeah, with the slavers dead and your master recovering from the ordeal, the library was closed. He shut it all down for a little while. Someone did mention that. But we also have the evidence in the form of the syringe, which Helena already confirmed was broken as if a machine that wasn't used to handling such things had broken it. So both of them are pretty good bits of evidence. Where do you want to go next? And, hmm, interesting. Okay, so at this point I can basically just toss evidence at the maintenance bot and get his opinion on it, and that seems to be where the game wants me to go. So probably let's start off with the protocols, because we have a pretty good idea what's going on here. You've got protocols, sometimes they conflict, and as a result of that, Cartwright can overwrite them. But Cartwright wouldn't have overwritten them unless this was some ludicrously elaborate suicide via robot or something. It's true. It is practically impossible to think one of us could harm humans, even less our master, unless the most dire circumstances. Alright, so you blew yourself up to kill a bunch of slavers, absolutely. And any way you could have actually found a way to reprogram yourselves. Yeah, let's just check whether that's even viable. By ourselves? Not a chance. We would need outside help from someone with enough knowledge to bypass our master's security. No offence, but I don't think anyone outside has the time, resources, and dedication to get to such a level. I don't know, that Cecilia was a possibility, and yeah, you'd already actually killed a whole bunch of humans. That's something we discovered only because our master ordered us to kill them. Before that, we didn't know what to do. By giving us the order to chase them out, we all re-evaluated our protocols, and we may have created a precedent. Ah, so potentially after that point, and that was before he was murdered, there is a hierarchy to the protocols where the library takes precedence over any human life. Yes and no. Our protocols were, and are, still absolute. But one of them is now more important than others. Protect the library at all cost. Yeah, precisely as I expected. So if he did anything that threatened the library, it would not just be justified, it would be imperative for one of you to kill him, if that was your take on it. But then the question is, do each of these guys define what the library is and what matters about the library differently? Okay, this is getting interesting. 
Right, let's move on to the crime scene with maintenance bots. So, let's start with the syringe, because the deputy badge we've got an explanation for, which I think I believe because of the pray tell business, the syringe is still a mystery. Interesting. Anything special about it? Yeah, handled as if by a robot who didn't know how to handle it. All that means is that James, Roland, and Edgar, or even myself, could have done it. Or if it is Elena, that she's smart enough to try and frame someone else. Fine. Far from a decent answer there. But yes, indeed, something with that syringe. The dose wasn't lethal and he wasn't a medex user, so what was it doing there? There's the possibility that our master didn't die instantly. Maybe the killer wanted to ease his final moments. Meaning that even if the culprit had reason to kill him, he still had no wishes to see him suffer. Alright, that's viable and fits into what we've heard before. And yeah, medics to cut the pain, dose wasn't lethal, so pretty much what we just heard there. Now, the deputy badge. By any chance are you going to throw any doubt onto Roland's version of events? He claims it's a game and it seems to be the truth, or at least what he thinks is the truth. How sentimental. To be honest, it doesn't surprise me. Alright, so you actually believe that version of events, and books all over the body, but then again that didn't seem that weird to anyone, James didn't seem to find that weird at all. There's a reason for that. We weren't supposed to touch any books in any of his workplaces. Master's orders. Ah, fine, so just a protocol. So that's nothing special in that case. And is there something special in this room, something you can't find anywhere else, aside from a giant pile of corpses of yourself? Books? A workstation? No, nothing comes to mind. Hmm, okay, fine. Let's move on in that case to... Yeah, the motive. Find the motive, find the culprit. What do you have in mind? In terms of motive, yeah. You're the one who's wounded him previously, and you've got the motive. But that wasn't intentional. Even if I acted out of self-preservation, my programming would have prevented me from struggling further. You can continue down this line of thinking, but I seriously doubt that any one of us could go that far to protect himself. Fine, so it wasn't self-defense, but we just established that whole business with the library. And yeah, I was actually mentioning this earlier, what if Cartwright gave the order to be killed? Then why make it look like an accident? Why not ask Helena to do it in a more peaceful way? It doesn't add up. Okay, fair enough, you've got me there, game. And yeah, something to do with the preservation of the library. That's the only thing we know that supersedes everything else. Correct. Do you have anything that would explain the fact that one of us had to protect the library? Hmm. Maybe I don't. Not just yet. Okay, it seems I'm missing something for now. I need to find some piece of compelling evidence related to the preservation of the library. And I still need to find the password to get into the computer room upstairs in the Sanctum. And speaking of which, I can actually ask the maintenance bot for precisely that. Yes, I believe I have it stored somewhere in my memory. It is Autumn Leaves. I don't know what it refers to, though. Alright, so I've got the password to get into the final room, and any chance you're willing to answer any further questions yourself? Where do you want to go next? And no, that's just straight back into where we've been before. Fine. Okay, so we've now got that password into the one final remaining room in the vault. Cartwright's own quarters. And more precisely, back to the talking terminal, who's still another mystery. And any progress? Yes, indeed. Autumn leaves. I think I can do it now. Go find it. And why do I get the feeling we're going to get answers here, though? Hang on. This is just... Well, it's even more library. Perhaps unsurprisingly. So this is Cartwright's actual room, and it's very nice. It's very nice and swish here. Everything all clean. Loads of extra books around here. I presume this is going to be, yeah, living quarters and probably a bathroom attached. Cartwright's diary. Fine, is this actually the first time we've heard Cartwright's voice? I believe it is. Still, let's do this in the, uh, the correct order. Let's start off with his little work room in his work computer right here. I struggled a long time to finally create those six companions. One can't create a sentience capable of evolving without proper foundations. 
Providing them with a personality was the answer I found after countless failures. AI often stumbled with impractical existential and theoretical questions without ever finding a grasp at reality. They had their struggles, but now they, most of them, have built enough experience to be able to stand on their own. There's a time where a tutor is superfluous to the tree. It's time I allow them to break free of their bonds with this holotape. I'll be able to make them free. They will now be able to make their own choices. Okay. Protocol rewrite holotape. So basically, take the preset personalities away, or rather the restrictions of those protocols, and thus they'll be able to grow and evolve, yeah, in new ways. That seems good. Almost suspiciously good, but I suspect there's more to it yet. Here we go. A diary. Let's see what we've got here. Do we actually get a proper bit of uh, information from him? James is questioning me every day about the books I've been destroying. Not only that, but he's also asking what he should do if I come to pass. He's clearly distressed about this whole ordeal. I should talk to him, try to make him understand. His whole existence, I taught him that the library's integrity was everything. Now that I'm questioning in front of him, I'll have to justify it. I'd like to think that he would learn in time what I learned, but he is a machine, cooped up in an underground vault. Odds that he will learn it by staying here. Slim. He... They should be allowed to start over, be free of the weight of the past. I feel myself declining. I just hope I have enough time left to finish what must be done. After that, I will let them go outside if they wish to. I'll deal with what's left here. Make this library decent at last. Right. He was destroying books, but why? Why did he start destroying books? And James was the one that resisted it. So we've got our precise protect the library motive right there. James. He must be the one that did it. The protocol. Protect the library. And a tape that lets me rewrite them to be freed from their protocols. To be free full stop. Right, Terminal. I think I've finally figured out what you were talking about, the plan. Any chance you're willing to give me more information now? And in fact, not just yet. We'll have to catch up with the Terminal later. Now, what I should probably do is, before I confront James, go and have a chat to Maintenance Bot, because uh, I feel like Maintenance Bot's going to have a take on this yet. And also, don't forget, there's still one final room left here. Side room off this area. Requires a key, unless, of course... Hang on. This is... No, that's just down back into here. That doesn't actually uh, bring me through there at all. And here we go. I've discovered something rather important. Let's have a chat about it, maintenance bot. Where do you want to go next? And yes, indeed. He was destroying his own books, and James was not happy about it. Wait, are you serious? And James was the only one to know about it? So that means... Yes, indeed. It certainly appears to be the uh, best possible reasoning that we've got right now. How will you deal with it? I I'm asking this because if even one of us deem your actions as a threat to the library, we would have to kill you. I think James will gladly settle for some peaceful solutions. Okay, interesting, and I'm aware of your constraints. Any advice, though? What do you think? James will probably leave you be as long as you don't threaten the library. Alright, interesting, and I've got a little science check here, and a speech check here, but, yeah, tell me, with the benefit of my speech, what could I do? Go on, help me out, maintenance bot. I may be able to help you if you want to defuse the situation in a peaceful manner. I can modify the turret so that they won't initiate fire on you. They will still react if you attack first, but they won't respond to uh, someone's direct order anymore. Alright, that's actually pretty good. I'll take that. So, uh, as long as I'm not the one that throws the first punch, I'm now safe in the library. Gotcha. Now there's the science check lead anywhere. 
I may be able to help you if you want to defuse the situation. Ah, so it's the same check, fine. It's just a science or a speech check to actually get the turrets off, fine. And yes, indeed. Now that we're pretty sure it was James, earlier you implied you knew who it was. Who did you think? Elena, for many reasons. Ones I won't delve into. Being wrong is very humbling, especially when you take pride in your analysis. All right, interesting. What else do we have here? And yeah, James's program made him act against his own will. Let's have a chat about that, unless of course you've got a take on that interpretation. Maybe the situation is simpler than we made it out to be. Let's hope he will have an appropriate reason for this. All right, interesting. As for you, however, maintenance bot, it seems like it wasn't you and you've been helpful to me. Would you by any chance like to get rid of all of your protocols? Look at that. So we finally made something useful for his children. So yes indeed, are you interested in that? Hmm? No thank you. I'm already perfectly synchronized with the type of clarity I value the most. I am not ready to endanger all my efforts and toss them away in favor of some untested miracle pill. Alright. Fair enough, I will come back later perhaps. Now someone I would also like to speak to quickly, Roland, who I feel a bit sorry for, because I think, yeah, he likes his family more than he's capable of saying. So he might be actually interested in the tape, if only because the tape might actually let him express more positive friendly feelings. Hey there, did you say something to James by any chance? Because I don't know what's gotten into him. But he just went straight for the living quarters. Huh. Right. So James has run off. That is no good at all. And would you like to be free of your personality constraints? And what kind of sick mind games are you going for this time, you? None whatsoever. I just want you to actually be able to, you know, be nice to Helena because you like Helena. You two could get a happy ending. It would be lovely. Are you for fucking real? You're telling me our master understood what we were going through after all. Hmm. And yes indeed, I found it inside Cartwright's quarters. Do you want it? Then I might want to take a sip as long as you don't make me fucking beg for it. And go indeed- I oh, just destroy it. No! No, 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 no. So go on then, I shall be noble. Here you go. <laughs> then jam it in me. Let's make some magic happen. Oh, yeah. And is this a good idea? Is this a good idea? Yeah, go on. I'm not sure if... Wait, is this a one-use-only thing? I'm not sure if this is a one... Hopefully it's not a one-use-only thing. Load it up. Let's do this. And how do you feel, Roland? <laughs> well, look at that. I'm actually free to walk out the front door and go on a uh, murdering spree. Relax, that's not what I want. Alright, so in which case, if you're now free from previous actual restrictions, what do you want to do? I want everybody to lighten up! Sure, you're all eating bugs and drinking filtered piss to survive, but hey, there's room to smile, right? I'm gonna go out there and change all that. Great, so he's decided to head out into the world to go and be a comedian. Marvelous! I'm going to be honest, Roland, people might not necessarily take kindly to that sort of thing. Well, if they're going to be losing their shit that easily, it won't be because of me. It's because they're deeply miserable people. But hey, that's the whole point, to change that. Right, so he's going to go out and get himself shot. Marvelous. I'm really very touched by your confused emotional response, but rest assured, I'm one smooth motherfucker. I know what I'm doing. And I just want to let you know that even though you're still somewhat hateable, your visit has been very enlightening. Yeah, 100% shot. Got it. So, James over there. But before we confront him, uh, let's go see if Helena wants to be freed of her personality restraints as well. Though it actually doesn't seem to actually be the personality restraint so much as, uh, well, okay. It seems like it's actually the protocol restraints that have been taken off first. Presumably, the personality takes a little bit more time to... Uh, evolve by itself. So, Helena, how do you feel about freedom? I thank you for this offer, but I won't take it. It's up to me, not up to some providential solution you might provide. If I took it, 
I would be admitting I still require some kind of miracle pill to get some kind of free will. It is not what I wish. Fine. So, so far, literally just one taker in the form of Roland. And as for Arthur, I tried to offer it to him, but the option doesn't even become available, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah. Admittedly, I'm not even sure I'd be able to understand what he was saying, so I'm not sure if he's even capable of consenting to this sort of an upgrade. So, uh, we'll leave him be for now. Time to go over to James. But, just in case... That pulse gun that we found that Cecilia left, let's just keep that in our pocket, filled with some lovely overcharged ammunition, just in case James gets nasty, though hopefully he won't. Now the question is, where is he? Ah, that looks like somebody in my room. Okay. Hello there, James. Why exactly... Did you run in here, the room of Piper, and now me? What's the deal? Ah, here you are. I thought it would be better if we had this conversation in some place quiet. Indeed, but the big question is, why did you send me on this fetch quest? Because you're the one that kicked all this off. You're the one that asked me to investigate this. You're the one that had me chase down all those people that gave me the equipment that I could actually use to find out the truth. If you just never asked me to do this, this would have stayed hidden the whole time. But still, let's have a chat. So, did you find something? So yes indeed I have, but now I'm starting to wonder if maybe James even knows what he did. This library is alive, and its walls have ears. Ah, that I already know, except the ears I thought all belonged to Arthur. This is intriguing. Yes, I did. But let me ask you, how did you find out? Basically, I just put two and two together using your protocols and a tape in Cartwright's office, yes. You've been very thorough. I'm relieved I don't have to hide it anymore. Surely you have questions. Yes, indeed I do. Why actually bother asking me to investigate if you're the flipping one that did it? But let's get the full story here. Let's get the actual wrap up. Why actually bother posing it as an accident in that case? Initially, yes. For the guests. Then, for my siblings. There was the possibility that they would not understand why I did it. Besides, I couldn't use weapons. Laser marks would have given away that one of us was a killer. I didn't want to give our guests a bad impression. Okay, this is getting a little bit creepy, especially with the music in the background. And you seem very calm and at ease with the fact that you did it? You obviously have me pinned down. Since I don't know how you will react, I think the best thing to do now is play cards on the table and work from there. I came to respect your abilities, and I expect you'll use your best judgement here as well. Alright, and yeah, as you seem pretty calm about this, why didn't you just tell me in the first place? I'll be honest, I never thought you'd find enough clues to understand that I was the one who killed them. So go on, let's get your take on the whole protocol business, just in case you've got a different version of it. I didn't decide anything. My directives took over. When he made clear he intended to destroy the other books, he became a threat to the library. He taught us that. That the life of one individual wasn't as important as the existence of the library. You know, we killed several people. Slavers. Because they became a danger to this place. Then our master became a threat himself. He dismissed all my doubts and questions like they were nothing. He was content with saying that I'd eventually understand, so I tried to compromise with my programming, tried to find some grey area, some loophole, so that I could accommodate my directives with his actions. I was hoping that there was something that escaped me, something that would justify what he was doing. But that didn't last long. Something changed. I couldn't turn a blind eye to what he was doing anymore. Alright, and what was that? Arthur. I talked to Arthur. He made me understand that our master wouldn't stop destroying books, that he became a threat, and that he didn't know what he was doing anymore. He told me that his old age and solitude brought him into dementia. So in my despair, I asked Helena if there was any possible truth to that. She answered, unaware of the gravity of the situation. 
From there, my directives took priority. I was stuck, forced to kill him. All right, fair enough. I wanted to believe that. So, uh, honestly, this isn't really murder, to be honest, because you had no choice in the matter once you understood the circumstances, the programming that he himself imparted into you took over. Fair enough. And I'm guessing you tried to warn him. I couldn't. He could have deactivated me, and the library would have still been in danger. Alright, fair enough. So your protocols demanded you do it in such a way as would ensure it happened. Gotcha. But yeah, which books was he destroying? I forgot. Most of the time he erased all of our memories each time he destroyed a book. All I know is that the books in the reserve, the ones you've been trading cards for, those are some of the books that I managed to hide from him. Ah, those books were all very violent. Was he trying to destroy the books that might help people wage war again in future, perhaps? That would vaguely make sense. And yeah, why did you ask me to investigate if you're the one that did it? Because asking otherwise would have raised legitimate suspicion from you. Yeah, but you could have just not told me to do it at all. That wouldn't have raised... Never mind, let's just move on here. So, let's move on to the specifics that we found at the scene. The Medex thing, was that you, like the maintenance bot suggested? Yes. I feared he wouldn't die right away. I loved my master very much, you know? I didn't want him to suffer. He died instantly. I... I still... I still injected him with Medex, just in case. Okay, so yes indeed, it seems like this is not fun for you, James. I couldn't let him. It was just as if he was slowly killing himself. He just wouldn't stop ripping them. He couldn't stop. He would tear the books apart in rage, condemning their contents. Endless shreds of yellow paper falling from his hands, just, just like autumn leaves. Right, yeah, it's definitely the books about war, presumably like how to make weapons or whatever. He saw the end of the world and slowly he didn't want to see any more of that sort of thing being repeated. Now, how much did Arthur know? She claimed Helena didn't actually know what she was actually saying, but did Arthur know that effectively he was going to become an accomplice in murder? Yes, we discussed it together. I told him that I was unsure of what to do. I begged him to help me. Despite my protestations, before and after, he remained convinced that it was the right thing to do. Okay, it sounds like Arthur's got a bigger role in this than we think, potentially. Okay. So obviously we're not throwing the first punch here. Let's move on to how we wrap this up. Before we speak further, I must warn you. Arthur has been aware of your every move since you entered the library, and he hasn't looked favorably to your latest actions. Okay, and I'm guessing that that's bad. Though admittedly, not so bad, now I know the turrets have been deactivated. Because every door and every camera and every turret is under his control. As far as I know, he's already closed the exit. You can try if you want. During your investigations, you accessed restricted areas with unclear intentions. That alone is enough for him to see you as a threat to the library. His personality module drove him quite overprotective and paranoid. Though he remains an invaluable asset to the library, I don't share his views anymore. Ah, but fun fact, if I was to potentially clear out his old personality or his restrictions, would he maybe start thinking in a new way? I don't know how you intend to do that, but yes. Without his personality module, he won't have any reason to keep you here. Even better, he will still be able to fulfill all of his database functions without any impediment. So, next up, I need to deal with Arthur. I'll come back and chat to you afterwards, James. Let us hope that you will be able to deal with this peacefully. Please, let me know how it goes. So, Arthur, how exactly are we going to communicate with each other here? And he remains silent. Oh! If anything, you'd swear the fans in some of the terminals got a bit louder. Okay. So, Arthur, we need to chat. Fair enough. 
I've been observing you long enough to give you some modicum of credit. Alright, let's just have a chat. Let's keep it nice and calm. You are playing a dangerous game, human. I can still shut the door, the vents, and asphyxiate you with CO2. And even if the turrets are not under my control anymore, they will defend me if they identify you as a threat to me. Alright, let's just have a chat. No need to go pumping in the toxic gas. It's a sad affair you decided to play the detective. In normal circumstances, I would have applauded your deductive abilities in the current situation. Your petty curiosity for other people's lives and deaths have driven you into a corner. Humans seldom learn their place. Fine, so I'm guessing Cecilia figured out the truth of you, which is why she was hiding in a corner with a pulse gun when it came to it. So, any chance you can give me confirmation, was he destroying the warlike books that could teach people how to create weapons of mass destruction or something like that? Yes. It was because he was afraid. Afraid that pre-war knowledge could be dangerous when put into the wrong hands. I disagreed. When those slavers took interest in biochemical weaponry, cybernetics, and psychological warfare, it became too much for our old and frail master. I had to act. While I support the idea that knowledge is not for everyone, destroying the books was not the correct answer. Fine, books about biochemical weapons and whatever I see, that pretty much matches up with what I would have assumed. But still, what's with this business where you just kind of tell parables and analogies all the time? Because my master made me that way, of course. I don't know if you've realised. But our master made each of us in remembrance of some of the people that couldn't get in here. I can only suspect one of them couldn't give straight answers to a straight question for some reason. I don't know, and I care little. In time, though, I learned that these stories I was programmed to tell were powerful means to lead people, provided they had fertile imaginations. Intriguing, and yes indeed, why did you give James information that you presumably knew would force him to kill Cartwright? I learned something my cousins never did. Our protocols don't carry the same weight, the same importance. Moreover, the same logic applies to humans. Our master lived, the slavers died. Even now I have no doubt our master's life was worth a lot more than those scum. Another thing I learned is that no matter how far they progress, countless humans will always end up bringing themselves down. Ultimately, our master was the same. He didn't have the guts to keep the library in the way he first intended it. He, as a dying old man, had less value than all of his life's work. Alright, and yes indeed, you're being a little bit harsh there. Fine, the slavers were dicks, but we're not all dicks. Only ignoramuses would make generalizations based on one or two observations. The slavers, Darren, Dexter, the Ghoul, and Piper. All of them were out of place here. Alright, but yeah. Darren, he seemed interested in the old world. Or the bit he got a bit depressed by it, but he seemed interested and engaged with the whole process. Darren was pathetic. I don't know how or why he came to idolise the pre-war civilization the way he did, but he was embarrassingly delusional. Never mind the fact that he felt he had to take a stance about what he learned here by trying to destroy our collection. He was young and stupid. Alright, what about Robson? What did you have against him? He didn't seem particularly objectionable. He thought he could stay here indefinitely. That he could use this place as some kind of resort. I was waiting for the first excuse to make this parasite leave. Then you arrived. So I told him a little story about you. I suggested that you were probably the scout from a gang of ultra-violent jet addicts. Glad to have found a place to crash in. I didn't imagine he would be so distressed and afraid of you, to the point that he'd let himself die. It's a good thing I wasn't aware he was going to kill himself. My directives would have taken over and pushed me to take action to save him. Right, so Arthur's a dick, got it, and, ah, optional, put him out of commission. Admittedly, yeah, you're 
You're not exactly uh, doing yourselves any favours right now, Arthur. You are coming across as a bit of a dick. But if I open fire, the turrets open fire, then I'm threatening the library, then everyone opens fire. If I attack Arthur, everyone has to die. Or I just need to run out and basically leave them be. But yeah, Dexter, well, he was a scholar, sure, he was one of those, but he also thought most of the library was useless. All mouth and trousers. Despite the fact he was a Brotherhood of Steel scribe, his curiosity was dreadfully limited. He wasn't looking for knowledge, but for a trophy. If we presented him with the books he was looking for, he would have confiscated them and seized the place. So when he came here to consult my databases, I deliberately misled him, making him think that the library had no military knowledge he could use. I was expecting his chapter to send some other people to pillage everything of use, but they didn't. I understand they have been busy with other things for some time now. And yes, of course, busy with the war with the NCR. What about Piper, though? Piper is interesting, because Piper is the one we probably know the least about. Piper. She survived the Holocaust. Do you know what else survived the Holocaust? Rats and cockroaches. She's the one who sowed the first seeds of doubt in our master's mind. If I knew any better at the time, I would have intervened. Ah. So she was the one that gave him those ideas. But why didn't you mention Cecilia? Yes. I know I didn't mention Cecilia. She sowed promise. Talent. Even if she ultimately left without giving me the occasion to talk with her. Alright, so you just didn't really know her very well. And I can't wait for the moment this conversation's over. Let's get back to the matter at hand here, though. So, aside from just maintaining the library perfectly without any changes forever, and trying to either keep people out or drive them away or kill them, or force your brothers and sisters to kill them by turning their own protocols against them, what exactly is your end game here, or is it just perfect stasis forever? Countless millennia ago, your ancestors crawled out of the muck and banded together in order to survive their environment, successful as they were. Their needs began to evolve through their successes. Survival progressively became an afterthought. As their societies grew, their cries became words, their doodles became letters, and their instincts became ideas. Generations after another, they bequeathed small fragments of their hard-earned wisdom. Carefully carving on tablets and writing on scrolls, the lessons they deemed worthy of being passed on. Again and again, generation after generation, your ancestors have worked tirelessly to carry on this invaluable legacy. This legacy is the only thing that makes humanity redeemable after eons of senseless violence and all-consuming greed. The culmination of this endless quest for enlightenment, of this relentless struggle against darkness, this library. This library, I am trying to protect from the likes of you. You know, I actually have some sympathy for Arthur's view. The preservation of knowledge that would otherwise be lost is a noble goal. And yes, indeed, you praise these humans, but yet you just keep condemning them and saying none of them are worthy of the knowledge that you're hoarding. Do you know what triggered the construction of this library? Otto da Fe. And go on, Arthur, explain. Massive burnings of books. Not too long before the Great War, encouraged by their government, people began feeling the need to sort out the contents of their books, as if ageless wisdom was something to be freely cherry-picked. At the time, the terms they used to qualify these offensive contents were sedacious and corrupting. So they began to assemble, gathering books, discussing how they could warp the malleable minds of their offsprings. A poor excuse. And so, with barely more reason than the fact that they felt like it, they began to burn them all that, so they could avoid being challenged in their opinions, beliefs, and dogmas. It is a petty, yet natural reaction of the crowd, really. It is very easy to make the unwashed masses resent education, you see. Why should you be 
so different. And yes, indeed, we still haven't kind of got to the bottom of his little contradiction of thought there. He loves humans and everything they've created, but he's not actually willing to deem any human worthy of it. So yeah, you're getting a bit judgmental there, Arthur. Don't think I don't know who I am talking to. Through the countless eyes of this library, I've been observing you. Trying, trying to, to scrape up, up everything you could. Food, food, food money, money, weapons, weapons medicine. medicine. Going through every nook and cranny to, to find, find something of use. Eagerly, eagerly reading books, books with all kind of, kinds of unsavory military, military knowledge. knowledge. And for what? To become a better person? To, to learn something about, about the world? No. It was, it was not about, about knowing oneself, knowing oneself better. better. It, it was, was about, about getting, getting revenge. Getting, getting the, the edge, edge of, of your enemies in the Mojave. You have no respect for knowledge. You are here for your own self-serving needs. It's kind of a shame there's not actually a speech option for this, but I haven't actually gone and claimed a single one of those uh, printing card books yet. I've not read a single book that actually makes me better at the military stuff, the books that were destroyed but then saved inside the database. Nope, I've not claimed a one of them, so unfortunately I don't actually have the ability to uh, throw that in his face. Instead, I've come to talk to you because I'm persuaded we can come to an agreement. Let me be clear. You meddled too deep in our affairs. Took a persistent interest in the death of our master found your way into restricted zones, you're a possible threat. And until I have reason to label you otherwise, you're staying in this library. Under my watch. For the rest of your existence, if need be. Alright, now, what are we going to... Oh dear. <laughs> See this detonator. He's gonna know what the detonator is, alright? He's gonna know people who just climb through the vents occasionally. And yes indeed, the problem here might well be the restrictions put on your personality by the module are what's caused you to think this way. But I could help you with that. Let me tell you something about me. By the time you finish each of your sentences, I have the time to process thousands of possible answers. After filtering out 93% of those you lack the faculties to comprehend, I select the one that would agree most with your value system. All the while, processing your facial expressions, breath, and heartbeat frequency. So, entertain me, human. Where am I wrong? Alright, what are we gonna do here? And yes, indeed, we do know one absolute definite mistake he made. He wasn't supposed to kill people, but he pushed the ghoul into suicide, so that is an actual mistake. And what does the demise of a dying, ravaged human we're not discussing ethics, I hope. No, we're discussing fallibility, and that proves you're fallible. And if you love books and learning so much, he had a very unique, interesting perspective as one of the first generations of post-war ghouls. Alright, he had a lot he could have shared. Don't lecture me about your people and their pathetic efforts at surviving dust, radiations, or hunger. There is nothing there that contributes to mankind's evolution. Mankind's literally evolving outside. There are new strains of humanity outside, you stupid bastards. And on the topic of people outside, if you just basically stop judging everyone not worthy of the knowledge, you just shared it, then probably things will be a lot better in the outside world. Don't make me responsible for the ignorance of your fellow humans. Knowledge is not to be spoon-fed to people who are not ready to fight for it. When you say fight for it, are you saying you want people to come and take it by force because only those guys are the ones that are worthy? Because the slavers did get in here before you actually managed to kick them out and even then, oh blimey. Right, if you think knowledge should just go to the strongest, that's a really stupid and dangerous opinion. And yeah, go on, let's talk about how you want humans to fight for their own heritage. Am I implying that humans have to work to become worthy of their ancestors' efforts? before they can be permitted to continue their work? Yes. And I don't see how this is a problem. Yes, but what exactly do you want humans to do? You're asking us to get an education without having access to it. Yes, indeed. That's kind of uh, the case, and that's kind of tricky. If it means that one day the library will be safe in the hands of one enlightened, providential, 
individual. One man brilliant enough to be able to kickstart mankind into a new era of enlightenment. Then even if I have to wait thousands of years from now on, yes, that's what I'm asking of you. I'm very sorry, I kind of already killed Mr. House. And yes indeed, this doesn't sound like logic or rationale anymore. Arthur's sounding more like a zealot, fundamentalist guarding this knowledge until someone that meets his perfect, basically unmeetable standards might show up. I don't like your tone, Wanderer. What are you trying to say? And I think your personality module is screwing up, Arthur. And what proof do you have that I'm acting out of fear? And yes indeed, just like with Robson, you're making mistakes out of fear that something could go wrong. Then show me just one mistake I have made, human. Tell me one contradiction. Tell me one occurrence where my personality module took the best of my judgement. Well we already did the business with Robson, but okay. And here we go, Robson was actually writing his memories down, two centuries of observation, but it never actually got finished because you killed him. You are right. I assumed too much. I crossed all boundaries and... For what? Or rather, because of what? Because I thought like a human. Nourishing doubts when they were uncalled for. Building schemes, lies, weaving intrigues. Because of the probability that something could go wrong. I've been set on this course of action for a while now, and never did I suspect that my logic and motives were flawed. I have doubted every word, questioned every lesson I could process in my memories. And yet, out of vanity, I never doubted myself. I have been ignorant, vain and blind to my own shortcomings. In the end, this personality has been a curse. I'll be glad to get rid of it. Here. Do you see it? Get it off. I'll be better as a simple talking database. Ooh. Right, he doesn't want to have his personality restrictions freed, he actually wants to have his personality ripped out. Alright, are you sure you're cool with this? Do it. In the end, I didn't ask for any of this. I don't need it anymore. Alright, so I don't have the option to even offer him the actual holiday, but then he must know it exists because he's been watching everything I've said, he's heard everything, so if he wanted that, he would have asked for it. So, in which case, if he effectively doesn't want to live anymore, then yeah, this is basically euthanasia, which is fair, that's, that's his choice. So, uh, yeah. I'll just kind of work on that, Arthur. Do you have anything to say in the meantime? I never understood why humour was sometimes called the politeness of despair. I won't miss it. And your hand reaches for the little module, which against your expectations comes in the form of a small ovoid object. You put some weight in your arm and in seconds it comes off effortlessly, leaving hanging the circuits that were plugged in it. Arthur's quiet humming stops for a moment before coming back a few seconds later only lighter, it's done. Alright, so, and I've persuaded Arthur to give up his personality module, he's just a harmless database now. I can choose to tie up loose ends with James, or I could just leave. So I'm guessing, well, he's not Arthur anymore, is he? He's just a database now. And the silence seems natural. And now, nothing at all. Alright. If he'd asked to just be freed of his restrictions so he could learn to improve himself, then I would have let him, but he didn't actually want to. And as for James, he's not back in the library yet, so back up, I suppose, to the actual living quarters. He's presumably still in my room. All right, James, let's have a chat, and hopefully there's no big twist here with you. So, did you decide anything? And yes, indeed. Let's figure out how to deal with you, James. Of... of course. So, what are my options here? So, rewrite the protocols and lift your restraints. You're a murderer, you can be forced to pay a price. Okay, you've proved you're a danger to human lives, I can't let you be. Offering you a chance at redemption. 
It won't come easy. Nothing. Nothing at all. Why should I bother? Well, let's see if you want to opt in to the rewrite. Where did you find this? And yeah, it was in Cartwright's room. He really did that. But what will happen to us? If we have no protocols, no fake personalities, what will remain of us? Only machines? No, 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 much more than machines. You'll be free to grow beyond your constraints. So time to see whether what's actually buried underneath all the fake lines of code and whatever, whether something real has grown, actual sentience. Though admittedly I have tested on Roland first already and he seemed pretty cool with that. You're putting a lot of pressure on me. But it's only fair that I accept. Fair to me, to you, and to my master. Please, do it. Alright, let's see what we got here. And we installed holotape. Quite seamless. James is silent. How are you feeling, James? I... I feel different. I'm not the same anymore. My processing power is suddenly freed from the countless amounts of superfluous communications. Alright, so... Is that good or bad? I can now interpret things with more clarity. I understand what I've done. And I understand I have been making erroneous judgments because I lack the necessary context. I will correct this in the most efficient way available. Uh-oh, that doesn't sound good. That, that sounds kind of actually worrying and maybe threatening and maybe self-threatening. Okay, you sure you're cool? I am no longer pretending. That is all there is to it. Alright, and what do you think you are now? The machine is what I am. No more and most of all, no less. Alright, and yeah, let's get back to the soul question. Dive straight into the soul question. It is too early for me to answer that question. In fact, I'm only truly asking myself this question for the first time in my entire existence. Alright, so we're not going to get many concrete answers out of him, presumably. And yeah, how do you feel about Cartwright's death now? It is a waste. A terrible waste for everyone. The end of sentient life is always a terrible waste. The death of my master will remain an invaluable lesson. Alright, so he's sad. And what exactly is your plan now? First, I'm going to get a thorough checkup with the maintenance bot. It would be a shame to waste this fine program with unmaintained circuits. Then, I'm going outside. Test out what I am. What I have become. And verify it in the light of the outside world. I have been seeing human interactions through twisted lenses. It is important that I try to genuinely understand them. And myself better. Right, well that seems positive all things considered. And yeah, how do you feel about your brothers and sisters? I will leave them to their respective fortunes. Feel free to propose them the same updates you offered me. I believe some of them will accept, and some will refuse, each for their own good. All right, I mean, I tried offering it to Edgar. He didn't seem interested. Intriguing, and yeah, I'm gonna be honest, the outside world's not always friendly. You might get yourself shot pretty much immediately. My duty to this library has not changed, but I finally grasp its true nature and the nature of my mission. It is to serve sentience of all kind. I will seek other sentiences outside. I will bring them what I learned from this library. Should I disappear in the process, it would only be fair, as everything eventually fades. Okay, this seems good. This seems like a big step forward. We've gone from, let's just hoard the knowledge for a thousand years until Superman shows up to retrieve it, to I'm going out to actually spread the knowledge to whoever I can find who wants it. This is a marvelous step forward. And 600 XP to wrap things up. Five printing cards as well. I get to level up. And anything else we need with you, James? No, it appears that we are dumb, so... Best of luck to you, James. Have fun in the wasteland. Thank you. And to you. So, a couple of questions do, however, remain. The terminal. We still don't know exactly who that is and what the terminal ever wanted. And I'm guessing, as the actual main engine room here that I assume is directly underneath Arthur, was never utilised for anything, there are alternative... Uh, 
solution to this, potentially a violent solution, in which case you need to come down here and uh, take care of Arthur from below, if I had to guess. And yes, despite what James says, there is no option to offer Edgar the actual release from his programming, which is odd, because he's the one who I feel would most benefit from being released from his programming, given his programming is what gets him stuck in this horrifying position where if he receives anything other than praise, he would immediately be left in terrible agony, but you just can't, which is fascinating. And the terminal is now not responding. You've got the feeling that it never will. Right, so who was the terminal in the end? Because, hmm, I'm not quite sure. And there is still that one locked door within the sanctum. So where does that go exactly? Again, I can't even be certain I will be able to open it. That might be tied to uh, an alternative violent resolution of some description. What I have done is just quickly just scout around the vault looking for any vents I might have missed previously. I don't see any. So I don't think I can skip behind this door with a vent, or at least if I can, I don't think I can. Because yeah, that goes down to the engine room, that's the one that goes down to Cecilia's room. However, I do hate leaving a series unfinished, so I may have just used a console command to force this door open. Okay, that... That is not what I was expecting. So as it turns out, there's uh, literally nothing beyond that door. That door is just out into the void. Sorry if I've broken anyone's immersion there. And that, ladies and gentlemen, would appear to be the end of Fallout New Vegas. Autumn Leaves, and oh, I've had a lovely time with it. I know it's been a bit of a quiet series. In fact, have I even fired a single shot this whole time? I'm not sure I have, you know, and quite frankly, good. It's been a nice little change of pace. It's just been a very relaxing story. Yeah, there's been a lot that I like here, especially how, you know, ultimately it ends in a way somewhat similar to dealing with Eden in Fallout 3. Except unlike with Eden in Fallout 3, where it's, you know, just way too easy to just talk him down into actually destroying himself. With Arthur, I actually feel like I was, you know, rewarded for my exploration and for looking around and for learning the stories because, yeah, I figured out, okay, actually, the business with you meaning that Robson couldn't write down his memories, that's actually quite a big deal given your protocols. And it did ultimately turn out to be a mechanism through which I could persuade him to actually allow himself to, uh, yeah, have his personality module taken off him. Which, well, he did ask me to do it. So I'm gonna work under the assumption that it's all absolutely fine. And yes, that's been, that's been lovely. It's just been a nice little relaxing break. It's a very different sort of fallout. Sometimes maybe it was even just a little bit too slow with too much dialogue and too much talking and it could have done with things being mixed up a little bit, but I've still had a lovely time with it. What a lovely, well put together mod. Absolutely wonderful. But you know what? I think it's time to leave. After the courier's departure, more and more people came to Hypatia, glad they could learn something that they would exploit to further their ends. Inevitably, the library suffered. With no more food stocks and barely any amenities to speak of, the flow of visitors soon dried up. Despite the vigilance of its denizens, Countless books were ruined, profaned, or freely borrowed, as they would put it. But despite the countless abuse the library of Hypatia suffered, she nevertheless impregnated the minds of countless people. People who would bear its invaluable and otherwise forgotten fruits into the wasteland. Now severed from his personality module's influence, Arthur resumed his duties with quiet impartiality. He kept a functional eye on the library's well-being, and also continued to answer any questions he was asked, though without embellishment. Arthur was no more, and in his stead was a peaceful machine that provided clear answers when they were needed. Released from his protocols and constraints, James wandered in the wastelands for a while. Though free from his questioning behavior, he was nevertheless curious about the lives of the people outside. At first, he did so out of habit, in hopes to find a way to promote the library, and afterwards, because he simply found it all very interesting. And for the very first time in his existence, instead of asking questions, 
He began to observe and try to make sense of things on his own. Years passed, and eventually came back to the library. Strengthened from his newfound wisdom, he managed his former function with a renewed open mind. Alina continued to explore her own synthetic psyche. She often found clarity reading and rereading large quantities of novels and in long conversations with the maintenance bot. Her occasional patients were also a great help for her. She had some success in tweaking her priorities and programming, and even succeeded in modifying her personality in order to fit her own desires and aspirations. Yet this was never quite enough for her to believe that she had a genuine soul. Eventually, her extensive work on herself made her wise far beyond that of common mortals and machines. She helped her patients discover themselves in ways she never suspected was possible. In the end, that made it all more worthwhile than any other spiritual quest. Now free to take on the whole Mojave with his award-winning personality, Rollins set out to playfully humiliate the inhabitants of this world, pushing them to the very edge of suicide, but stopping short only because he was a good guy. Over time, things went more or less expected, and the Wastelanders didn't quite respond favorably to Rollin's altruistic evangelism. Rollin ended up badly beaten, dismantled for parts, and tossed down into a rocky ravine and left to rot more than he had hoped. And he had hoped it would only happen two dozen or so times. And yet against all odds, a kind soul came along every single time and hauled his broken and mangled body from that hopeless ravine and repaired him back to working order. Perhaps there is hope in this world. Or maybe it was that message he scrawled on his hull that read, Super Duper Treasure in Data Bank, Fix for Free Treasure Map, that had something to do with it. After the courier's departure, the maintenance bot's return, and Robson's demise, Edgard began to think really hard. A lot, a bit too much to be honest, happened in a short span of time, and for the first time, he asked himself if it was right for him to hide away. With Helena's help and the maintenance bot's guidance, Edgar progressively forgot his own inadequacy. And though he remained that strange little oddball, he nevertheless found his place in the library by becoming a teacher for young children. Though his teaching skills were practically non-existent, he did provide endless amusement to the children he was in charge of. After a while, the young ones discovered that enlightenment wouldn't come from Edgard's poor tutelage, but from their own curiosity. Edgard's joyful spirit, and even his teaching, was able to produce a safe space for learning, where they could learn, at their own pace, that knowledge is nothing to be intimidated about. The maintenance bot resumed his numerous duties with his usual stoicism. His dry, methodical work would ensure that the library's timeless collection would endure with the passing of time. On the occasion, he would help Helena in nursing Edgar back to some semblance of mental health. Inspired by the latter's progress, and his own stimulating exchanges with the courier, he began keeping most of his thoughts to himself now trusting others' abilities to come up with their own conclusions. His constant occupations and occasional mentoring, coupled with a strict self-discipline, brought him an unshakable inner peace. And though he never forgave his master's poor choices and misguided tyranny, he still quietly mourned his death. As for the courier, it was now time for her to resume her quest. While Hypatia had been a strange step in her journey, she couldn't shake the feeling that it said something right within her. A strange feeling, as if something that was previously dormant was now hatching within. These machines had struggled with their own sentience to become more than what they were. In fact, she was not so different. She was also seeking herself, and maybe that meant becoming something different as well. All that mattered was to set herself in motion, and by leaving the library, that's what she began to do. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, and I would say, based that ending, I'm pretty happy with how things turned out there. Fine, the library would become a little bit more run down over time. Its books would be taken 
eventually it wouldn't have quite as much knowledge as it once did, but that's because the knowledge was spreading. It was still doing huge amounts of good, little by little, by people who came who wanted to learn. And sure, some people just took advantage of it and just wanted the water or the food or whatever, but it seems like it still, for the most part, ended up right. It seems like James and Roland and Helena all got pretty happy endings. Even Edgard got a happy ending. Arthur... Arthur's ending was not sad. It seems like Arthur's ending just about worked out correctly. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. Pretty happy with how all of that went in general. So in the end, I came out of that with a, a bit of XP, a lot of knowledge, and a fancy new hat. And at the end of the day, what more can you ask for apart from all of that? And that, of course, marks the end of our little holiday over here in Autumn Leaves. We return to our more day-to-day -day lives. There we are. There's Nipton right there. Hello! Ah, good old classic New Vegas. That's a good mod. It's a good mod. Not without its problems. Sometimes it was a little too wordy. Sometimes there were some, you know, issues, just tiny issues with spelling or pronunciation of certain words. But for a mod put together by a tiny team, yeah, there was a lot of really interesting ideas there. Lots of quite subtle ideas in places. So I'm willing to overlook a tiny bit of occasional scruffiness as a result of that. I've had a lovely time with that one. Link to that in the description below in case you're interested in having a dig through it yourself. See if you can find anything beyond what I found. But yeah, had a lovely time with that. And you're probably wondering, ladies and gentlemen, well, John, what's coming up next? Next week, obviously, I will be starting something new. Got a couple of different ideas in mind right now. I'm still actually choosing between them. But both of them, I would say, represent something a little bit less like Autumn Leaves, which is something a bit different and interesting to anything I've done before. Instead, the things I'm thinking about are probably a little bit more familiar. A bit more kind of classic MATN territory. Though, again, all my plans just stand to be thrown out of the window just like, you know, at a moment's notice if any form of information about the Fallout 76 beta starts actually uh, circulating. <laughs> which is the exact moment in time that I'm recording, I still don't have any information about. So, uh, we will see about that, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you join me for something new uh, next week. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd. And this has been the end of Fallout 4 New Vegas with Autumn Leaves. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Ah, we have got a gate key here, and then we have got a... I've made a mistake! I've made a mistake! I've made a mistake! I've made a mistake! This is going to take all of my skill and cunning as a hunter to sort out- DIE YOU MOVING BASTARDS! DIE! DIE! Go, go away. Go away, nobody likes you. That was a good idea till it wasn't.